It's September 2nd, 2019, and it's time to review five of the most outrageous, infuriating, or just plain baffling things that have happened lately. It's your facepalm five. Let's count them up. Number one, right-wingers throw tantrums over New York Times slavery history series. A couple of weeks ago, the New York Times published The 1619 Project, a series of articles and other features looking back at the history and legacy of slavery in the United States, 400 years after the first enslaved Africans arrived on the shores of Virginia. Sounds like a necessary and long overdue effort to grapple with the most shameful but also most important area of American history, right? A good job by our nation's self-proclaimed newspaper of record? Well, not everyone thinks so. For instance, Newt Gingrich, this imperishable shithead, he tweeted, quote, The left doesn't get it. Slavery was and is terrible. There are slaves today who need liberating. A 1619 history of slavery project is great. Insisting that slavery is the defining reality of America is simply factually wrong. By the way, dig the top reply when I went to screen cap this. Get at him, Captain Pike! Newt wasn't the only right-winger to register his displeasure at the 1619 Project. Fox News Channel personalities Jesse Waters and Byron York, libertarian know-it-all Timothy Sanderfer, Ryan Saavedra, who writes for Ben Shapiro's The Daily Wire, all-purpose reactionary shit noggin Mike Cernovich, and a bunch of other folks from that end of the political spectrum piped up and said pretty much the same thing Newt said. Yeah, 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 slavery was bad, but stop trying to make us feel bad about it. I'm accustomed to conservative positions provoking a certain amount of cognitive dissonance, but I'm not sure I've encountered an argument quite as preposterously nonsensical as this insistence that, sure, slavery was a terrible thing, but it shouldn't reflect poorly on the United States or its history. One of these assholes, Eric Erickson, actually complained that the 1619 Project disrespects the sacrifices white people made toward ending slavery, and accused the Times of viewing the subject through a racial lens. I mean, does he think the best way to examine the history of centuries of institutionalized enslavement of black people is to leave race out of it? I think he does. Unless you want to specifically celebrate the courage and nobility of white people, I guess. Then it's all good. You know, it's too bad there isn't, like, an entire media platform dedicated to pandering to thin-skinned white folks who are sick and tired of being guilt-tripped over all the misery and oppression and death we benefit from on a daily basis. Oh, what's that? There are many such platforms? And the next story is about one of them? Well then, number two, journalists side with Breitbart after ban from O'Rourke event. Last week, Joel Pollack, an editor for Breitbart, was kicked out of a campaign event for presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke in Columbia, South Carolina. Pollock accused O'Rourke of abusing the press and suggested he was booted from the event because he couldn't be counted on to give favorable coverage. Some high-profile journalists came to Pollock's defense, including Elizabeth Williamson and Matthew Rosenberg, both of the New York Times, who each characterized the O'Rourke's campaign's ejection of Pollock as wrong and a denial of freedom of the press. And you know what? They're right. A presidential campaign kicking out a reporter because they expect that reporter will write unflattering coverage of their candidate should concern us and piss us off. Except that's not what happened here. What Breitbart does is not journalism. What Breitbart does is... Actually, let me quote the statement released by the O'Rourke campaign in response to the Pollock controversy. Quote, whether it's dedicating an entire section of their website to black crime, 
inferring that immigrants are terrorists, or using derogatory terms to refer to LGBTQ people, Breitbart News walks the line between being news and a perpetrator of hate speech." Unquote. And personally, I think it's far too kind to say that Breitbart even walks the line. It's a right-wing propaganda site that unabashedly supports the Trump administration and regularly amplifies white nationalist, misogynist, and transphobic talking points. Williamson, Rosenberg, and any other legitimate journalists feeling sorry for Breitbart might also want to consider that the day before the event where he was kicked out, Joel Pollack had attended a press conference where he accused Beto O'Rourke of mischaracterizing Trump's open and long-standing support of white nationalists, then published a story about the exchange which referred to Trump's support of white nationalists as a hoax. Williamson, Rosenberg, and others sympathetic to Pollock's predicament might also want to bear in mind that the event from which he was ejected took place at Benedict College, a historically black college, which makes the O'Rourke campaign's decision not to admit a writer for what, for all intents and purposes, is a white nationalist website seem even more reasonable. I get that journalists are especially protective of the freedom of the press. They should be. We all should be. But the freedom of the press exists in order to protect the public's access to the truth, not to protect the careers of bigoted hacks cosplaying as reporters. Defending the First Amendment is great, but in doing so, it's okay to distinguish between people like Joel Pollack, platforms like Breitbart, and actual journalists. In fact, it's absolutely vital that we make that distinction. And if legitimate journalists are unable or unwilling to draw a line between what they do and what Breitbart does, that tells me something about their priorities, and it's not good. Hey, this next story deals with a media platform that props up white nationalists, too. Number three, YouTube CEO welcomes hate mongers back to the platform. Ah, oh, YouTube, why did I have to tie my fate to you? Because you're the only video sharing platform big enough to enable a relative nobody like me to make a living doing this shit? Okay, that's a pretty good reason. But hey, as long as I'm stuck with you, could you do something about all the horrible people who use your website to spread intolerance and abuse people and make lots of money doing it? No? Because you make money when they do it too? Okay, that's what I thought, YouTube. <laughs> Just figured I'd ask. Thought you might have changed your mind. As YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki made clear in a blog post published last week, YouTube has not changed its mind about the whole hosting Nazis and misogynists and conspiracy theorists thing. In fact, after a lot of soul-searching, Wojcicki has come up with a brand new line of bullshit, I mean philosophical justification, to explain why YouTube allowing professional hate mongers and harassers to prosper on its platform is a good thing, actually. Quote, YouTube is built on the premise of openness, Wojcicki writes. However, quote, a commitment to openness is not easy. It sometimes means leaving up content that is outside the mainstream, controversial, or even offensive. But I believe that hearing a broad range of perspectives ultimately makes us a stronger and more informed society, even if we disagree with some of those views. So there you go. YouTube is doing us a favor by exposing us to a broad range of perspectives about, say, the cancerousness of feminism, the inherently lower intelligence of black people, the existential threat posed to European and American civilization by immigrants and refugees, and the imminent ruination of women's sports by trans people. And hey, don't you dare accuse YouTube of taking a self-serving, hands-off approach when it comes to hateful and abusive content, because it has community guidelines, and those suckers are enforced. For instance, the same week that the CEO published her blog post, YouTube took down the channel belonging to infamous Austrian white nationalist Martin Sellner, who has ties to the Christchurch shooter and has been banned from entering the United Kingdom. 
Of course, not long after that, YouTube reinstated Selner's channel, along with the channel of another white nationalist that had also been taken down, explaining to BuzzFeed News that removing the channels had been the, quote, wrong call. This is just over three months after YouTube joined Facebook, Twitter, and Microsoft in the Christchurch Call to Action, wherein they pledged to take action to curb the spread of extremism online. Banning extremists from your platforms is an excellent way of doing that. Wait, I should probably rephrase that in light of recent events. Banning extremists from your platform and not letting them write back on is an excellent way. Number four, New York City police unions furious over firing of killer cop. Week before last, the police commissioner of New York City, James O'Neill, announced that Daniel Pantaleo, the police officer who choked Eric Garner to death, has been fired. That's right, the cop who killed an unarmed civilian on the street in front of witnesses on video five years ago just got fired. So the system works. Unless you're a New York City cop, that is, in which case you might not be too happy. The Police Benevolent Association, the city's largest police union, tweeted, We are on our own. No one has our backs. Ending the tweet with the hashtags, no confidence, and job is dead. Gothamist reported that New York City cops posting on the law enforcement rant message board were outraged as well, with one user declaring, quote, This shit is why I'm retiring in seven months. I hate knowing every day that through no fault of my own, I could be that guy. That guy being Officer Pantaleo. Pretty sure if you choke a guy to death while he's telling you he can't breathe, it's not a through no fault of your own situation. Elsewhere on the law enforcement rant board, Gothamist reports, quote, the Garner family has been labeled savages and ghetto dwellers. Good to know Detective Sipowitz has weighed in. Actually, that's not fair. By the end of the series, Sipowitz had mostly gotten over his racism because he's a fictional character. Also, he'd been promoted to sergeant, so. Anyway, what do these cops who are complaining about this want? This Pantaleo prick straight up killed a guy whose only crime was illegally selling loose cigarettes, and as punishment for that, he lost his job five years later. And because of that, the job is dead? These cops really think that getting fired five years after the fact for killing an unarmed civilian on the streets of New York City in broad daylight is too harsh of a punishment? Apparently they do. Not all of them, though. One cop, speaking anonymously, said to Gothamist, quote, As a police officer, I understand how they see it, but they're not seeing how the racist ways of the police department led them to this. That anonymous officer also believed that race plays a factor in the outrage being expressed by his fellow cops. Eric Garner was black, and Daniel Pantaleo is white. There's a thin blue line, the officer said, but it has a white streak on it. Guess there's not much chance for someone like this guy to get elected president of the cop union, huh? Now it's time for the segment devoted to some of the other things Donald Trump has done recently to disgrace the presidency and embarrass and or endanger the United States and the rest of the world. It's number five, the further misadventures of Lord Dampnut. Please keep in mind, as always, the following is not a complete list. Trump did a lot of shit these past two weeks, like try to buy Greenland, propose stopping hurricanes by nuking them, and lie about getting phone calls from China that never happened, but instead of trying to be comprehensive, let's keep this on theme. He said Jewish people who vote for Democrats are very, very disloyal to Israel and the Jewish people. He also said only weak people would say anything other than that. An authoritarian leader with open contempt for the rule of law questioning the loyalty of Jewish people who don't vote for him and characterizing people who oppose him as weak. Nothing bad has ever followed from that, has it? 
He's reportedly so eager to get his border wall built before the 2020 election that he's directing officials in his administration to seize private land and ignore environmental regulations, promising to pardon anyone who gets in legal trouble as a result. He said, not for the first time, that he's considering ending birthright citizenship, even though as president he doesn't have the power to just do that, since it's in the Constitution. His Justice Department sent an email to immigration court employees that included a link to a white supremacist blog. The DOJ later claimed this was an accident and that the racist content should not have been included in the email briefing. Right, they're supposed to save that shit for their private WhatsApp group. There was a point while preparing this video that I found that last story a bit too on theme. And then I saw this story. Trump tweets video using same logo as suspended white supremacist Twitter account. Trump shared what's being described as an independently produced video, commenting, Thank you for the support as we make America great again, that ends with this logo which is virtually identical to this logo, which was tweeted in 2016 by the Twitter account of VDARE, which is a white supremacist website. And hey, funny story. You know that email to immigration court employees I just mentioned that contained the accidental link to a white supremacist blog? The article that was linked? Published on VDARE. Weird how so many people who work for or support Donald Trump seem to be reading the same white supremacist websites. Oh, but let's not jump to conclusions now. The Twitter user who made the video that Trump shared, he insists he didn't know that red, white, and blue lion's head logo was from a white supremacist website. In a tweet that he has since deleted, Something Wicked insisted, quote, I googled Trump logo PNG. It returns several images, which I recreated. Google tagged that lion as MAGA. If it's something else, it occurs to me the real question is, why is Google associating white supremacist metadata with Trump slash MAGA? Do you realize what this guy is saying? That by linking that VDAR logo to Donald Trump, a Google algorithm correctly identified white supremacist content for once? Maybe there is a glimmer of hope after all. Now that they've figured out how to find it, all we have to do is convince them to stop helping to propagate it. Yeah, never mind. We're screwed. That's five. Speak out, act out, resist, look after each other. Hey folks, thanks for watching. Happy Labor Day to my fellow Americans who are celebrating Labor Day today. Hope you got something out of this one. If you did, please click like and share the video and subscribe to the channel if you're not subbed already. And also, please consider helping me to continue making videos like this one and like all the videos I make on this channel by becoming a supporter of this channel with a monthly donation through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron for as little as $1 a month. And believe me, those $1 a month pledges add up and help me out tremendously. But if you can afford it and you think I'm worth it and you pledge $5 a month or more, you get yourself a shout out at the end of the Face Palm 5, just like these folks, my newest $5 or more per month patrons. And their names are Chester Plemony. Thank you, Chester. Morton Fagerly, thank you, Morton. Tara Lioness, thank you, Tara Lioness. Charles Glaw, thank you, Charles. Dan Pierce, thank you, Dan. Ranted Beliefs, thank you, Ranted Beliefs. Louise Teeter, thank you, Louise. Stephen Rhinestone, thank you, Stephen. Richard Moreland, thank you, Richard. Mr. Sios, thank you, Mr. Sios. Ken Glenn Jr., thank you, Ken. Samantha Schultz, thank you, Samantha. Alex Inkster, thank you, Alex. And Brian Evans, thank you, Brian. Thanks to everybody who is my patron at whatever level you are pledging, however long you have been a patron. I appreciate you so much. I could not do this without you. Thanks to all of you for just watching and liking and sharing and subscribing and doing all the free stuff that allows me to continue to do what I do uh, that, I guess means something to some of you. 
<laughs> and it certainly means a lot to me that I get to do this um, for my full-time job. It's it's something that, especially on Labor Day, you look at something like this and you think, wow, I really do have it lucky. And I have it lucky because of you folks who are kind enough to watch and to help out where you can. So thank you all so, so much for watching. I appreciate you more than I can say. And I'll see you next time.